Good morning, friends and neighbors, and happy Friday to you. This is Professor Bruce Hartpence with another networking video. We have been talking about routing protocols, and so we're going to continue our discussion with OSPF, or Open Shortest Path First. And this is going to be part one of the series. And we are going to be working through chapter six in the Packet Guide to Routing and Switching from O'Reilly. Before we dig into OSPF specifics, let's talk a little bit about some general ideas. Now, we didn't talk too much about them when we went through RIP, so let's talk about these ideas right now. Generally speaking, we have a couple of ways of talking about routing protocols. We can say interior versus exterior. We can say what they're used for. We can talk about convergence times. But generally, when you're trying to compare a couple of interior routing protocols, we say, oh, this one's distance vector or this one's link state. Now, if you watched uh, Despicable Me, you know about vectors, magnitude, and direction. So that's what RIP does, and we'll talk about that here in just a second. And then we have link state. And link state protocols are interesting because they have a little more detail about the network around them. They know a little bit more about, well, for lack of a better word, the link. So they understand speed. So there are some other values that they use or that they take into account when considering whether or not to add a route to the routing tables. And in most cases where link state protocols begin by calculating the topology starting with each router as the root of the topology and then working from there. Let's try and do a small comparison here. If you were looking at a distance vector routing protocol like RIP, the minute you turn RIP on, the routers start exchanging routing tables. So router number one in this topology would say, hey, here's my routing table and I'm going to send it to all my neighbors. And then router number two, upon receiving the routing table update or the RIP update, decides whether or not he's going to install those routes. But really, at that point, all that router number two understands is that it can get to those destinations via router number one. It doesn't know very much about the quality of the links. It doesn't understand much more about the topology than what router number one told it. And the only value that we have in the metric is how many hops away those destinations are. So, magnitude, how many hops, and direction, via R1. That's it. If we start talking about link state protocols, it's a little bit different story. Link state protocols, the protocol will come up and the routers will tell each other, hey, I'm here, I'm alive. By the way, here's what I can do. Take a look at the link speeds around us. And here's some routing table updates or here's some networks that I know about. And then they'll have this exchange about their capabilities, about whether or not the networks are attached, are stub networks, things of that sort. So there's a whole bunch of information or capabilities that the routers will exchange. And then link state protocols, in particular OSPF, has this quality of being a neighbor that becomes important to us later on. After that exchange goes on, they don't do anything else. They just drop to a straight up hello message. And so the routers will exchange hello messages and that's it because nothing else is going on. There's no reason to make me recalculate my database, recalculate my routing tables. I just tell you, hey, nothing's happening, nothing's going on, and here's my hello message to prove it. Well, now that we have that under our belts, let's talk a little bit more about the OSPF specifics. It is an interior routing protocol, so it's mostly for small networks, although they can be larger than the RIP networks. There's more complexity to OSPF when compared to RIP. It is link state. And so it's not just straight up routing table exchange. So you're not going to see OSPF packets that have just a dump of the routing table. OSPF uses link state advertisements to exchange information about what they know and what their capabilities are. There's a couple others out there, uh, as I've indicated at the last bullet here, but that's our big one. And then we move into steady state, that is after the routers have exchanged their information and everybody's learned the topology, we use that small hello packet and that's it. That's all you see on the network. So the small topology that we're going to work with uh, as we talk about OSPF basics is going to be this one here. And you can see that we've just got a pair of routers, they're neighbors, and we're going to turn on OSPF. And yes, it's silly to use OSPF on a, on a network this small, but it, it works great as, a, as an example. As the routers understand 
each other and they learn about the OSPF routes, you can see that we've got routing table updates in the same way that we had RIP updates. And there they are. They're the, the ones that begin with the letter O for OSPF. And I've circled here the administrative distance and the metric associated with these OSPF learned routes. Now I'll talk more about the details here, but for us right now, suffice it to say that the administrative distance for OSPF is 110 and that that value you see for the metric, the number after the slash, is not just hop count. What happened when we turned on OSPF? Well, initially, the routers send out these hello messages. They don't know anybody else is around, and that's all that they're trying to advertise. I haven't heard about anybody else. I don't know about other networks. I don't know about other routers. I just have these hello messages. But once the routers exchange the hello message, it's kind of like a wake-up call. Hey, wait a minute, there's somebody else out there. And they immediately start sending out link state updates and database description messages and requests for information between each other. Now you can see initially that these go to the multicast destination specified for OSPF, 224.005. But the minute they learn about each other, they start sending unicast updates back and forth directly between them and then eventually they drop back into the multicast messages to advertise what they've learned and what they know and then finally after all this flurry of activity dies down they drop back into the straight up hello messages. This is an example of the hello message. You can see that we've got the multicast at layer 2 and the multicast at layer 3. We can see that this also has information about the area. We'll talk a little bit more about that next time. And then the hello message also has a lot of information about the type of network, the type of router, neighbors, and all of the capabilities of this particular router. And here we get to something a little more meaty. This is an OSPF link state update packet. And I've actually cut this one down quite a bit because link state update packets can get large as the topologies get more complex. But what I've circled here is the information that the two routers will exchange about a particular network. And you can see that there's a little more information about the network than you might find in a RIP packet. There's a little more information here about the router and where this came from, why this link state update was being sent, uh, things of that sort. All right, well, I think that'll do it for this week's OSPF. It's just a little introduction. We're going to cover more about the details of OSPF and some of the operation on this topology next time. Remember that there's an awful lot of information out at brucehartpence.com, and I'm adding stuff there all the time. You can also take a look at the Packet of the Week videos. I've taken a little hiatus from those because we're doing all these other uh, networking videos, but there's lots of other stuff out there. And we have been going through Chapter 6 in the Packet Guide to Routing and Switching. Thanks again for watching, thanks again for listening, and may your packets always reach their destinations.